Well, it's my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Rob Kylenbach. Rob is the state extension forage specialist and also a professor of plant sciences at the University of Missouri here in Columbia. So, Rob? Yeah, good. All right. So, when I look at cover crops, I probably look at them from a unique perspective compared to many of you, and I see the cover crops as fantastic feed. And that's what I want you to remember about this presentation today. Cover crops are fantastic feed, and I'm going to show you the data that proves that cover crops are fantastic feed that can be used in livestock systems. Now, there are a number of cover crops that my colleagues uh, before me and after me today will tell you about, from the small grains to the brassica species, even annual ryegrass being used as a cover crop. I won't go into the uh, specifics with regard to to their use in cropping systems, but rather I want to focus this presentation on their use in livestock systems. And we see a lot of the small grains being used as cover crops. From a forage perspective, I will tell you that if you want both fall and spring grazing, rye and wheat are probably going to be best from the small grain perspective. If you only need fall feed, okay, oats actually will make more autumn growth than will rye. I'll show you some data on that in a moment but the oats typically don't overwinter here. That can be both a negative or a positive, depending on the cropping system that they are, are overlaid. Because the small grains, for the most part, during the cover crop phase or the phase in which we're using them in these systems are vegetative, the feeds are excellent quality. Bottom graph here looks at the acid detergent fiber, okay, of both rye and wheat uh, over the course of uh, several months, and this is data we collected, frankly, about 10 years ago uh, at a couple of locations here, both at our Southwest Center as well as the Forage Systems Research Center up at Linnaeus. Acid detergent fiber, the lower that number is, the better, okay? Less fiber means it's more digestible, okay? And just to give you a frame of reference of how good a feed that is, excellent quality alfalfa. Excellent quality alfalfa would be somewhere around 27 or 28%. ADF. In fact, you'd be lucky to get it trucked in here that good consistently. Okay? These crops are running typically in the high teens to very low 20s for most of the winter in acid detergent fiber, and that's going to lead to the livestock gains that I show you here in, in just a moment. Typically, the forage quality is very good over winter as we get into reproductive growth in spring. Forage quality declines, as you might expect. Rye matures, uh, more, matures earlier in spring than does wheat. And because of that, the forage quality follows, uh, uh, as you might see in this graph. Typically, I would say with the small grains, they are very easy to manage from a grazing perspective until you get to about April. Everybody's a genius to April, and after April it gets hard because cereal rye begins to make seed heads and palatability goes down as, along with forage quality. Here are some work that we did looking at an average daily gain of unsupplemented beef heifers, okay, grazing both wheat and cereal rye. Now, in this chart, you'll see that we have the two crops in the far. I have a mental problem with right and left. I get them wrong every time. So if I say something's on the right, it's not there, look on your other right, it'll be right there, okay? But you'll see over here that the, in the first column, and I'm sure you're sure this is L left, on the left side is uh, the crop that we used. The middle is average daily gain. Average daily gain is a very good measure of forage quality, all right? And then total gain, which is in the far right column, is a function of both average daily gain, is how much each animal's gaining, plus, or times rather, how many stock you can put on an acre. So a crop that grows a lot can have a higher stocking rate, thus lead to more total gain per acre if quality was equal. In both cases, we uh, have very good quality feeds. Again, unsupplemented beef heifers here gaining between 1.6 pounds a day and 1.8 pounds a day on wheat, wheat being slightly better quality, and that is reflected here. But total output per unit area, or get total gain per acre, is higher for cereal rye because cereal rye produces about twice as much feed for us from a forage perspective as does wheat during the grazing phase. Oats, uh, oats also are very good feed. Uh, oats are used as cover crop both as an autumn as well as sometimes a, a spring-planted crop for short-term uh, use. 
I would just tell you that from a, if we're getting oat in the vegetative stage for autumn grazing, uh, the yields, uh, excuse me, the quality is very good. Crude protein values, as you can see here, that's what CP stands for in the 20s. The total digestible nutrients in the 70 range. Uh, you're not going to, stock don't see it feed like that often. Another one we've done some work with is annual ryegrass. Uh, annual ryegrass is, is one that I, I both have a, sort of a love and hate relationship with. In that annual ryegrass is easy to establish uh, and has a number of agronomic characteristics from a forage perspective that we like. That last one, as Dr. Bradley pointing, points out, can be difficult to terminate, can be a, a significant issue going forward. Typically with annual ryegrass for grazing, we can begin grazing about 60 days after establishment. Uh, and, and we found that it is really a species because of its regrowth potential that works well in rotational grazing uh, with uh, not trying to overgraze or leaving about a three inch stubble uh, working best for us. We have found that annual ryegrass surprisingly stockpiles pretty well. The picture here is of some annual ryegrass I had up in north central Missouri at the Forage Systems Research Center. Uh, and if you see in the top, I'm pretty sure left corner, I got to the field in the middle of January one year. I thought, man, all this annual ryegrass is dead and it's going to be of poor quality. And uh, I was kind of disappointed. And it was about 10 degrees when we jumped out of the car and we jumped back in pretty quickly. But the point is, when you moved that uh, canopy back and you looked below the surface, there's still a lot of green leaf material in there. Uh, and as you look at the quality of that green leaf material, it actually maintains its quality pretty well. Here's the uh, quality of annual ryegrass uh, over the course of winter as measured again as acid detergent fiber. And remember, what did we say earlier? The lower ADF is, the better. Good. I just want to be sure everybody knows that because we're used to in America, if it's higher, it's better. In this case, it's not. ADF, lower the better. Look, annual ryegrass is, I can give a lot of descriptive terms to it, but I'll just tell you it's fantastic feed uh, from about the time you can begin to graze it, which Typically, we begin grazing in November a lot of years uh, until May. Once we get to May, it begins to produce seed heads pretty uh, rapidly, and the quality declines thereafter. Uh, here's some work that we've done with annual ryegrass. This work was actually done uh, out at uh, uh, Agroforestry and uh, Horticulture Center at New Franklin, looking at the use of uh, annual ryegrass. Uh, these, again, with unsupplemented beef heifers um, over a couple of years, and we've got days of grazing. Uh, in the in uh, was one of our columns average daily gain and then total gain per per acre depends a little on the year as to how the animals gain between a pound and a half and and about 1.8 pounds a day again on uh, with heifers uh, but total output per acre uh, somewhere between three and five hundred pounds of beef being produced given that soccer calves are worth shocking amounts of money these days probably more than they're really worth. Uh, this is a significant uh, a, a amount of, of output. Uh, I think you can say the value of gain probably in the feed yard right now is, is exceeding a dollar uh, per pound of gain, and so you can do the math here as well. Uh, talk just briefly about the use of the brassica forages, or the brassicas as cover crops. We think of them as forages, but they obviously fit into the cover crops, uh, cropping uh, concepts as well. Uh, we've worked with these crops for a number of years. Uh, when we find that the brassicas, whether working with tillage radish or turnips or typhon or uh, other hybrids of the brassicas, typically they produce a, about three tons per acre if we get them seeded correctly for autumn grazing. Uh, and they continue to grow after the killing frost. Uh, uniquely, uh, depending on how they're managed, we can actually uh, graze both the tops. And for those crops that have bulbs like turnips, the stock will eat the bulbs as well. Okay. That may not always fit from the cover crop perspective, but it is certainly from a feed perspective a possibility. Uh, two or three things that we encourage producers who use the brassicas for grazing to consider is that strip grazing really works best for utilization here. These crops are very turgid, very full of water. When stock walk on them, uh, they'll break very easily, and so strip grazing uh, and a planned feed use pattern really helps a lot. Animals can bloat on brassicas, they are so digestible, it's not uh, so digestible that they'll get almost like a feed yard type of bloat. It's not a bloat that you would expect like you would get from animals grazing alfalfa or white clover, uh, but rather uh, a bloat like you might expect uh, from animals on a, on a ration uh, that is, is too high in starch, okay? So typically we uh, recommend to producers that they use some sort of dry roughage 
or, or hay typically to, uh, for stock uh, as part of the diet with brassicas and try to limit brassicas to about 50% of the diet. Again, very good quality feeds uh, is in terms of, of how we've measured them here in, in ADF. Um, they're very good feeds up to about uh, the first of the year. Maybe you get through January some years, but boy, once we get much past the first of the year, typically I say that you're living on borrowed time with most of the brassicas. And here's why. These crops are about 90 or 95 percent water. They can handle some cold weather down to maybe 10 degrees Fahrenheit. No big deal. But in Missouri, just like we've had here in the past week where we've had about a 70 degree change in temperature, that's really tough for plants that are frozen completely solid. So they freeze solid, that's not the problem, but the warm days that follow, these things sort of turn flaccid and the palatability of them uh, goes down accordingly uh, and then the fiber values will then sort of follow that uh, in time. So uh, I, I think of the brassicas as pretty decent feeds up to the first of the year and then after that, uh, really sort of living on borrowed time. Some years you get them a little further, some years you don't, okay? And, and I'll finish up finally talking about uh, a number of the legumes that are used for cover, whether it's crimson clover, uh, sometimes people are using things like alcite clover, hairy vetch, uh, Austrian winter pea, and some others. Uh, typically, uh, we've had, we, we've tried to work with the uh, legumes as, as part of a feeding system and cover crop sort of perspective. And while our, our, um, our experience is this, these crops, you can seed them in autumn, they develop a rosette, they give you a little bit of cover, but honestly, there's not that much forage to work with. And while what's there is great quality feed, there's just not very much of it there for use. And they, when they come on in spring, they come on so late in spring very often that there's just not uh, as many days of, of feed there as we'll get from some of the other crops. So they may be something that they could be mixed with other crops to uh, maybe be uh, you know, a part of the system, but in and of themselves, they're very difficult uh, for us to plan grazing systems or grazing use around. So that is what I have this morning, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take a shot at them. Yes, sir. Rob, what would you recommend for a uh, early spring cover crop to graze? Let's say we're, we're coming off of hay and uh, we maybe want to transition a field into to wheat in the fall and we would want to graze it with a cover crop. What would you recommend to go in in the springtime? Yeah, so the question is, is what would we plant in the spring for a cover? If you're having to plant cover crop now that you would like to graze, best option is probably oat planted towards the end of February 1st of March. We can get, you know, 60 to 90 days worth of grazing out of it before it's terminated. And then you, whatever crop you want to use and then thereafter is, is probably the best we've got. Yes, Terry. How sorghum Sudan grass for grazing? Yeah. For all of How's sorghum Sudan grass for grazing? How is sorghum Sudan grass for grazing? Well, that's the loaded question of the day, Carrie, and I knew you would ask it. Uh, we've done a, just finished a three year study looking at sorghum Sudan grass, uh, as well as uh, pearl millet and some others for uh, forage use. It is, it, in terms of their value for grazing, they're not bad quality crops, particularly if you use some of the stuff that has the brown, brown midrib genes in there. It really helps in terms of digestibility. The problem is just from a straight forage perspective, they've not been very cheap grazing for us through the summer. The cost to establish the crop, and the fertilizer requirements, and we, it's one of the things we've been studying is their fertilizer requirements, are such that, frankly, perennial grasses are much cheaper for us uh, in terms of summer grazing. If they were part of a system where you know they're used as cover, and you know really a, a lot of the cost can be shifted to some sort of uh, you know cover crop perspective, then perhaps. But just as straight forage crops, they're very difficult for us to econo economically justify. And I, I expected to have a much fancier, nicer answer about that when I started all that research. And the answer is, is that there are better choices. It just took me three years at a couple locations to figure that out. <laughs> Yes, Tim. Rob, do you think you could overseed overgrazed pastures with some of these uh, cover crops? So the question is, can, can you overseed like an overgrazed or maybe even thin, perhaps fescue pasture with some of these cover crops? So I, I, I've tried that, Tim, many times. And I, I have to say, I've had a lot of failures. 
going into, say, a, a thin fescue pasture and trying to put, say, annual ryegrass or cereal rye or wheat, even some of the brassica species we've tried. And, and here's what happens, at least to me, unless I use an herbicide to knock back the thin pasture, okay, so something like germoxone or a Roundup application perhaps, what happens is if I get good enough growth conditions in autumn that, those, that my cover crop can establish well, I'm surprised how good a pasture is when you stay away from it, that is you don't have stock on it, and there's good growth conditions. It, and it provides such a high level of competition that I look at the cover crop and I go, you know, it doesn't look very good here, and it's just, it's, it's really uh, been difficult for me to think that that was a, a, a good way to, uh, you know, spend money. I'd rather spend money on perhaps better management for the perennial grass or putting some fertilizer on the perennial grass as to trying to seed in another crop. Now, again, if you can, if you want to use herbicide, if it's part of a renovation program and you wish to, you know, terminate the pasture that's there and put in these cover crops as part of a transitional program, then, you know, you can do some of those kinds of things. But without herbicide, it's really difficult. Yes, Ranjith. Hey Rob, about how many farmers, uh, livestock farmers, use cover crops for grazing? About how many livestock farmers use cover crops for grazing? There are about 50,000 uh, beef producers in Missouri. Uh, many of them also have cropping operations, but a great deal of them don't as well. As to how many are using cover crops for grazing, I, I don't have a good value to give you. I can tell you that when we look at seed sales of uh, things like annual ryegrass or cereal rye, and a, a lot of those acres are used for pasture, I can tell you it's a growing concern, but as to, uh, I don't have a good feel for what the number is.